Uh, today's <clears throat> reading is from 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 14, the healing of Naaman. <clears throat> Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man and in high favor with his master. Because of him, the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man, though a mighty warrior, suffered from a skin disease. Now the Arameans, on one of their raids, had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my lord were with the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his skin disease. So Naaman went in and told his lord just what the girl from the land of Israel had said. And the king of Aram said, Go then, and I will send along a letter to the king of Israel. He went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of garments. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you my servant Naaman, that you may cure him of his skin disease. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to give death or life that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his skin disease? Just look and see how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me, that he may learn that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the entrance of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go! Wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became angry and went away, saying, I thought that for me he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, and would wave his hand over the spot and cure the skin disease. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? He turned and went away in rage. But his servants approached him and said, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more when all he said to you was, Wash and be clean. So he went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. His flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. This is the word of the God. Thank you for the reading, Dennis. I invite you to pray with me before we uh, engage this text and uh, see what we can learn this morning. Let us pray together. Lord God, thank you so much for your word and this opportunity to hear it, to reflect on it, and for you to proclaim it in our lives. We pray that that your spirit will enable us to have open minds and hearts so that your word will truly penetrate our hearts and transform us. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. If it's not broken, don't fix it. You know, like some people say, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. You're familiar with this time-tested saying, right, everybody? But why, you know, does it ring so true? I think it's because we know that when something really is broken, it can be difficult to fix it. I mean, usually, when something breaks, we know what to do. If the car breaks down, you take it, you know, to the car dealer or to your favorite local mechanic, a bicycle go to, uh, you know, goes to the bicycle shop. We might even repair something ourselves when we're handy enough. I mean, I one time repaired a 65-inch flat-screen TV, believe it or not. I watched uh, you know, a bunch of YouTube videos and bought a little soldering kit and replaced, I think it's called transistors or something, I'm not sure. But in any case, it worked afterwards. I was very proud of that. Even if something, you know, more complex, like a marriage or a relationship goes off the rails, 
We can go to a therapist or a counselor or maybe a pastor. But what do you do when something isn't working and there is no way to fix it? The repair is too costly or it's not worth the time or effort. And it's better to shell out the cash to buy a new device which will then you know, fail within 18 months and, and you have to swap it out again, parting with more cash until it fails and the pattern continues. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. Now to break this cycle, France, the country of France, began to require makers of certain electronic devices, including smartphones and laptops, to tell consumers how repairable their products are. So many manufacturers <coughs> excuse me, selling these devices in France must give their products a score or what's called a repairability index. And it's based on a range of criteria like how easy it is to take the product apart or the availability of spare parts and technical documents. And it's part of their effort to combat planned obsolescence. The concept of intentionally creating products with a limited lifespan that need to, need to be replaced frequently. And yeah, I know. I mean, there are actually companies who do that. They intentionally create products that you are forced to replace after a certain time. But let me ask you this. Can humans be repaired? I mean, you and me. Is it possible for us to be repaired? Or let me put it another way. Can humans experience healing? Well, humans themselves have been answering this question since the time of Hippocrates, who, by the way, lived about 400 years before Christ. Dr. Luke, who wrote part of the New Testament, was himself a physician. Jesus referred to the medical arts when he said, healthy people don't need a doctor. But sick people do. And of course, Jesus became famous as a healer himself. Sometimes he had to flee the crowds who were seeking a miracle from Jesus, the healer. Then medieval doctors tried to heal people with leeches, bloodletting, drilling a hole into the cranium, when necessary. So thankfully, you know, we've come a long way since then and the medical profession today is one of the most respected careers. And so we clearly believe that the human body can be repaired and fixed and restored to normal function. And if certain parts of your body is damaged beyond repair, maybe you can get an artificial body part like a new hip or a new knee an arm or a leg. And so I guess you could say that the human body has a strong repairability index. But then what about your soul? What about your mind? What about your relationships or, or maybe your marriage? Can your soul, for instance, be repaired? Let's look at name and story in today's reading and see what we can learn. And it's an interesting story because here's a guy who gets a twofer, okay? Both his body and soul are healed. But let's get a little closer to the story and I want to point out, you know, a few things to you, okay? And the first one is Naaman was sick. The Assyrian commander was really, really sick. 
It says in verse 1, Naaman suffered from a skin disease. Now from some other translations, we know that it was leprosy. What we today know as Hansen's disease. And in that time, leprosy was as feared and as dreaded as perhaps cancer is today. And it was a diagnosis nobody wanted to hear. You can imagine Naaman going to his doctor and saying and praying to himself, don't let it be leprosy, just don't let it be leprosy. But his fears were justified. Now, I don't know how much you know about this disease, but this is what someone with ancient leprosy experienced. It begins as small red spots on the skin. And before too long, the spots get bigger and start to turn white with sort of a, a shiny or scaly appearance. And pretty soon the spots spread over the whole body and, and hair begins to fall out, first from your head and then even from your eyebrows. And as things get worse, your fingernails and your toenails become loose and, and they start to rot and eventually fall off. And then the joints of your fingers and toes begin to rot and, and fall off piece by piece. And your gums begin to shrink and, and they can't hold your teeth anymore, so you lose them. And leprosy just keeps eating away at your face until your nose and, and palate and even your eyes are rotted. And then you waste away until you die. And the Bible says, but though Naaman was a mighty warrior... He suffered from leprosy. He was a big man. He was a powerful man. He was a wealthy man. But he had leprosy, and all of a sudden he had to bear the social stigma that went with it. And that's the thing about disease. It doesn't respect any particular person or individual. It doesn't matter who you are you can still get sick. And so Naaman, this powerful commander, is sick. Now contrast his situation with what we read about the Hebrew servant girl. And she's one of the two heroes in the story. She was weak. She had virtually no status in the Assyrian culture. She was the spoils of war. It says in verse 2, one day, while the Syrian troops were raiding Israel, they captured a girl, and she became a servant of Naaman's wife. So she was a captain. She was a servant. She was young. She was a girl. But she didn't have leprosy. Naaman was rich and powerful, but he had an incurable disease. She was weak and powerless, but she had her health. And then, this nameless servant girl dares to make a suggestion. In spite of her status as a nobody, she has the courage to speak up. She sees a need, and, and she tries to fill it. Seems like she doesn't have a shred of, of schadenfreude in her body. Instead, she lifts her voice to offer encouragement to her oppressor. And so one day she says to Mrs. Naaman, you know, there's a fix for this condition. She says, oh, if only my master could meet the prophet of Samaria, he would be healed of his skin disease. Mrs. Naaman then has a chat with her husband. He discusses it with the Assyrian king. With the king's blessing, they make arrangements for a quick trip to their sworn enemy, Israel. And for the king of Israel, however, the trip becomes a political nightmare 
And he says, am I God, a God with the power to bring death or life that I get orders to heal this man from this disease? What's going on here? That king is trying to pick a fight. That's what. Elijah the prophet hears what had happened and he tells the king, don't worry about it, send Naaman to me. So Naaman, with his horses and chariots, arrived in style and stopped at Elijah's door. Now let me hit the pause button just a little bit from the story to make my next point. And that is, fixed jobs require something. Fixed jobs requires faith. If you want something fixed, it requires some faith. It's true whether you are, you know, where you, whether you're taking the car to see a mechanic or whether you take your daughter to see a doctor. The object of your faith is the mechanic or the doctor. Because you have to trust them, right? You have to believe that the surgeon operating on your child did not get through med school on a pass-fail basis. And so I want you to think about your body and about just disease, you know, just for a moment. This business of seeking a cure for disease is kind of tricky. On the one hand, our bodies are deteriorating and we're all headed for death. I think we all know that. It's a destination none of us can avoid. But on the other hand, who can blame us for, for seeking a cure and, and thereby extending our lives as long as possible? In the end, however, death will claim us. And no amount of praying or fasting or pleading, or crying, or hoping will change that. And so that is where faith comes in. When the praying is done, we live by faith. Because our lives are really not our own, are they? And as people of faith, we believe that, that our lives are really in God's hands. And so, in a way, whatever happens to us in life, God can use for good, can't He? And so, we entrust ourselves into God's care, and so whatever befalls us, in a way, is good. We're good. Our final destination is secured. And so, we give glory to God. But at some point, the body is just not fixable. In this story, fortunately for Naaman, the news was positive. The Assyrian commander could expect a good outcome, except something gets in the way of his healing. Pride gets in the way. Because you see, pride often gets in the way of repairs and healing. Whether a repair is, uh, or healing is about your life, or about a relationship, or your spirit, or your body, pride can somehow get in the way. Because let me ask you, how many arguments have you had with your spouse or maybe with a co-worker or a friend that started with something small, right? And then it escalated out of control because you just couldn't let it go. Where you said, you know what? I'd rather be right and lose a friend than pick my battles and save a relationship. You'd rather be right than be happy. 
And so Naaman is at Elijah's house, and he's with the great prophet in Israel, and immediately things go south. Elijah doesn't even appear. Instead, he barely acknowledges the important general and the, you know, the, the efforts that he made to travel such a great distance to see him. Instead of meeting him personally, he sends him a text message. And the text message says, Go to the river Jordan and immerse yourself seven times. Your skin will be healed and you'll be as good as new. In Naaman's eyes, this was totally unacceptable. It says, but Naaman stormed off, grumbling. Why couldn't he come out and talk to me? I thought for sure he would stand in front of me and pray to the Lord his God and then wave his hand over my skin and cure me. Those rivers in Damascus are just as good as any river in Israel. I could have washed in them and been cured. So Naaman was ticked off by how he was treated. So do you see what happens? Suddenly, Naaman is a nobody. He's at the clinic and they tell him to take a number. And he feels disrespected. How can they treat a commander like any other leper waiting for a word or a touch from the prophet? So here's the thing. Naaman in his pride is forgetting something. And it's something we often forget. He forgets that he is in fact no different than anybody else in the hour of need. Right now, he is the beggar. He is the sinner, the leper, the human, the one who needs help. He's all of them. And in the sight of the prophet and of God, there is zero about Naaman that distinguishes him from any other leper. And so he's forced to swallow his pride and bow in humility. And in that humiliation, he realizes the truth that is so hard to accept. Like all of us, he is simply in need of help. He can't go it alone. He has to accept Elijah's help or go home as a leper. He can be humbled and healed or be proud and leprous. He can go big and go home as a leper or he can go small and be healed and whole. His call. And so for Naaman, the problem is pride. You see, the truth is God is God and we are not. And he does his things his way. But Naaman thinks, well, I have all of this figured out. I want God to do things in my way. And when God has other plans, he kind of like has a royal fit. I thought that, you know, for me, for me, he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and would wave his hand over the spot and cure the leprosy. That's what I think should happen. And maybe you and I feel this way inside as well, you know. We know that at some level, God has many sheep, many different sheep. 
But, but we also feel that, that somehow we are special. Like, you know, we are some of God's favorites, aren't we? God will surely wave his hand or, or use a magic wand or cast some spell so that my life can change for the better. Surely God knows I need this promotion. God knows I need this new job. God surely has to do something to save my marriage. In my case, you know, he has to do something special to heal my disease. Surely he must patch the holes of, of my ruined and broken life. Well, the good news is there is a bomb in Gilead. There are some healing waters. Help is available. And often it comes from an unlikely source. And in Amos' case, it comes from unnamed servants. They are the other heroes of this story. Because it says in verse 13, his servants went over to him and said, Sir, sir, if the prophet had told you to do something difficult, you would have done it. So why don't you do what he said? Go wash. Be cured. It's like they call an emergency intervention with their master. And so the mighty Naaman humbles himself before the God of Israel. He endures the snub of a prophet of the Most High. He walks down to the muddy Jordan River. He removes his clothes and, and reveals his sick and, and broken body to his servants. And then he lowers himself into the water and immerses himself completely. And he shoots up out of the river and gasping for air. And then he takes a second plunge and he repeats this until the sevenfold baptism is complete. And you know the rest of the story. When he emerges for the final time, his whole body is healed and he is whole as a person. His faith along with some help from his friends that made him whole. And we read the story, right? And it gives us some hope. And still, most of us know that sometimes things are just beyond repair. Your car is totaled. And you can't do anything about it. Your fried laptop cannot be brought back to life. And so Naaman, in what looks like a rite of baptism, goes under the water not once but seven times. And he emerges not a leper but a new man. Maybe his nature has not changed, although there is some evidence to suggest it has. But he now is a new and fresh and healed and different man. It's similar to, to what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians. Anyone who is joined to Christ is a new being. The old is gone. The new has come. And so if you feel that your relationship with God is broken or beyond repair, or maybe someone else, if you feel that way, then this is good news. It's like then instead of attempting a repair on your cell phone, you issued a completely new phone. And the same is true about your life when you put your trust in Jesus Christ. By God's grace, through your faith, you are made new. You have a new nature. You're a new creation. Through Christ, you get a 
fresh start with an entirely new outlook and perspective. And this new nature, says Paul, is nothing short of the nature of Christ himself. The thing is, though, even though our souls have been repaired and our lives made new, we still need to return to our world where there are broken dreams and shattered relationships and unfilled expectations. That's our world, right? But when we reflect on Naaman's story, we see that even in such a world, we too can be repaired. We can be mended and healed. Because God's arms of love can comfort a human back into wholeness. His balm of forgiveness can heal broken hearts. The justice of restoration and restitution can reset the human condition. And so if you ever feel wounded and scarred and broken and like you are falling apart, remember you too can be repaired. Because that's what Jesus is all about. And you know what? He guarantees his repairs. As one gospel song puts it, He is the healer of broken hearts. He'll mend your shattered dreams. He'll pick up all the threads of your broken life and weave them together again. To your soul, He'll bring peace and joy. A friend in need, He'll be the healer of broken hearts. Is Jesus of Galilee. Amen. Let us pray. Merciful God, we thank you that you heal and repair our lives through your Son, Jesus. Father, on the one hand, we understand and know that we all and our bodies are destined for death. But on the other hand, we know that you are the God of miracles. You have placed medicine and healing into this creation. And you can heal our bodies. More importantly, you can heal our souls and our broken relationships and our shattered dreams. And you can repair us beyond recognition as new creations. I pray, God, that you will powerfully intervene in our lives as we obey you and trust you and your Son for the healing you provide. And so if there's any broken relationship here today, if there's any shattered dream or anyone who's disillusioned with life, I pray that you will repair, that you will repair that. If there's anybody here today who's dealing with disease and illness, we know, God, that you can bring new health, new healing. And I pray that you will repair that, as we also understand that sometimes things just can't be fixed. But even then, your love and your grace remain with us both now and forever. And so we praise you, God, in the name of Jesus, the healer. Amen.